All right, well, I think we left off here, and we'd already talked about this, but I just wanted to emphasize that there's this difference between Aristotle and Plato on the, the power of wisdom, you might say, the power of, of goodness to overcome all things. And one thing, that, that makes among, one thing among many that makes Aristotle more practical is that he believes that even very good people can become corrupted if they're placed in an environment where there's lots and lots of temptations. And that's why he places more emphasis on the need for a good constitution, okay? Because it's, he disagrees that if you place wise people in charge, they will be incorruptible and will always do the right thing. He says even wise good men can be corrupted by the love of honor and money. And so, you know, the, he develops over time in this book this idea of the mixed regime of the polity, a constitution that, you know, keeps the different interests in check and kind of keeps people in line so that they have an incentive to do the right thing and to not be as easily corrupted, okay? How is it that he argues that the love of honor can corrupt man? Because I think like that's something that would be kind of difficult to corrupt. Yeah, I mean, love of honor is usually identified as something that keeps people good and honest, right? Because they want to get that recognition. Right, maybe? Yeah, you know, it has to do with what do you, what do you potentially do to obtain honor, you know? Do you do always just what is right, or do you cut corners? Do you do, yeah, yeah, in order to get the appearance of honor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could honor be more maybe like status or mm -hmm. stuff like that, instead of actually like personal honor? Maybe that's what he's looking at? Yeah. Like also instead of like, you know, actual how to find honor will keep someone in line, but it's more of like connected to a status or some kind of like symbol or something that, that could be corrupted. That's exactly it, right, right. You know, in, in his day, honors were those tangible things, you know, either positions or awards, you know, the trappings of success and so forth. And so, yeah, I mean, people seeking those honors, sometimes it can really help motivate people, you know, to be public figures, to be admired by others. But if the honors, the trappings, become the most important thing and the thing that you want above all else, Sometimes people will cut corners and do bad things in order to achieve those honors, right? Hoping that they will not get caught so that they can get the recognition and the, and the you know, external um, signs of honor, yeah. So your idea of personal honor is really a concept that comes along a bit later. I think that Aristotle tries to maybe develop it a little bit himself, you know, by making a distinction between the worldly success and actual quality or virtue within a person. Plato tries to do the same thing. But it, it, as far as it's playing out in actually in societies and civilizations, it took quite a while um, to develop this idea of maybe personal honor and integrity being more important than those external things that people look at. And, and to this day, I think there's a, uh, there's a need for both. It's, it's, the external trappings of honor motivate people and uh, motivate them very strongly. And so I don't think we should throw those things out, but we need to be very careful to look <coughs> into and to define how they should be obtained, right? You know, by what means they should be obtained. Like, you know, our famous Lance Armstrong. I mean, he had a lot of worldly honor, right? People admired him. He had all sorts of prizes that he'd won from his cycling competitions. So he had all the worldly honor, but <coughs> he wanted that so much that he cheated time after time after time. <coughs> and part of the problem probably had to, had to have been the process. In other words, you know, there wasn't enough checking. There wasn't enough, you know, supervision not only over him, but a lot of other people in that, um, in that line of competition to make sure that cheating didn't occur. Okay? But when he was finally found out, all the honor, well, was stripped away from him and, and actually now, you know, the dishonor is greater because of it. So if you don't have 
good checks and you don't have people looking into the process, you can get a lot of Lance Armstrongs, you know. Um, and that ends up not only corrupting him or people like him, but also society as a whole. Can you kind of understand that? Because if, if people see too much of this, it, it leads them to doubt, um, you know, their own definition of honor or to doubt the efficacy of, of, of trying to obtain honor the right way. Good, uh, good questions there. Um, Aristotle also teaches uh, that uh, the good, the best society needs to focus not on, on war but on the arts of peace. Um, and this also makes him a little different from Plato because remember Plato did put the democracy, the military regime, second best, okay? And since uh, in effect, you know, the Republic was next to impossible, that's elevating democracy quite highly. And he said it was because democracy is at least about honor, you know, uh, about uh, striving for honor. Now, Aristotle doesn't, certainly does not uh, put that down, military success, the, you know, the virtue of, of the military. Uh, but what he points out is, again, you know, using Sparta as his example and being extra critical of Sparta, um, he says that such a regime that is so focused on military success and, and where, the, where military success is elevated to the, you know, the pinnacle, that's what uh, the greatest of men want to achieve, <coughs> tends to be a warlike regime, okay, where they go out and find opportunities to continually be at war uh, or in a posture for war, okay. And he says the problem with that is they don't cultivate the arts of peace as well because of that focus on war and defense, okay? And so after, if there's a period of time uh, when they're not at war, they're at danger because they don't have that direction, okay? And not only that, but they're not as good at developing their community if that's their sole focus. The um, you know, the Klingon mentality, I guess, is what he's talking about there. You know, the Klingon, we're, you probably don't even know what I'm talking about, right? The Klingon, Star Trek, Klingon race was totally warlike, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and so all they knew and all they were looking for, and it, you know, when they had to try to deal with the Federation, uh, which was all about peace, they didn't really know how to interact with these people, and they didn't really understand their priorities. You know, why do you want to go explore the universe, right? just for the heck of it, or you know, why do you want to have these luxuries? Actually, these luxuries are effeminizing somehow. They're, you know, they're weakening you. Um, and so the Spartans were very much like that, you know? And so the allure of civilization almost seemed to them to be a weakness, you know? Um, but Aristotle is basically saying, well, what is all this for? What is the military for? What is national defense for if it isn't for protecting um, the society so that it can actually experience the fruits of peace. And the fruits of peace include, you know, high civilization, even the attainment of luxuries, you know, definitely the ability to carry on and develop your economy, okay, and to have a political system that's not unstable, but actually <coughs> works that you can participate in and so forth, okay. So that's why I asked the question, is it possible not to know what to do with peace? Okay, Does, do you understand the question? Okay, if people are constantly either at war or in a posture of war, okay, can they be unfamiliar with the rest of life to the point where they don't know what to do with peace and that they, they are restless when they have it and they go try to find some other you know, opportunity to fight, you know? My mom asked me recently, you know, why, you know, why, uh, it seems as though people are attracted to conflict, you know, why is that? I mean, it seems very destructive and everything. I said, this is a part of human nature. It's a part that people don't want to admit to, because we're all supposed to be peace-loving. I mean, it seems irrational, right? But yet, it definitely is. And, you know, it, it, and in a way, Aristotle's better than most of us at accepting that and basically saying it, you know. Uh, calling it what it is, but saying, you know, if you can't, 
if you can't make the transition from war to peace and if you can't focus on, if you can't become more moderate and basically use war only as a means to obtain peace and the fruits of peace, then you're out of balance. So you've got to check that part of yourself, which is, which is uh, warlike to that extent. Um, he says of the Spartans mentioning the legislator, which is Lycurgus, their sort of legendary lawgiver um, that, that supposedly came up with the Spartan way of life. He says down at the bottom of page 54, one might also criticize the fundamental principle of the legislator as, a, as Plato criticized it in the laws. For the entire system of their laws aims at, at a part of virtue, military virtue. That's a part of virtue, okay? since this is useful for conquest. So as long as they were at war, they remained safe, okay? because they had a purpose. <coughs> they had a purpose, so everybody worked towards that purpose. But once they ruled supreme, they started to decline because they didn't know how to be at leisure and had never undertaken any kind of training with more authority than military training. Okay? And military training and political training are two different things. The skills that, that are useful in the military, supposedly, are different than those that are useful in civilian life, at least to the extent of knowing how to rule. Okay? Now, you know why he says that? Okay, how in the military, how are decisions made and how are they carried out? Top down without questioning things? Yeah, it's hierarchical. Yeah, so the person at the top makes the decision, other people carry it out, okay? And what happens if other people down the line start arguing and saying, well, that probably doesn't happen very often, but what if it did, you know? And they, you know, we don't want to do that or that's a stupid way to do it want to do it some other way, what happens? Depends a lot of times, I think, maybe. Okay, it depends on the leader? Depends on, I don't know, how it is for you guys. I don't know, I mean, I figure it just depends a lot on how people go about expressing their dissent. Like mm -hmm. if they openly try to combat the way the order is given, they'll probably get squashed. But like if they try it and they don't, and it doesn't work, and then like, generally there's a time where you can come and say, yeah, this isn't working. Mm -hmm. Tell them, like, relay it back up and tell them we need to do something different. Okay. Try this. So if you're able to, if you follow the orders, but then it doesn't work, and you use the appropriate protocol to relay that information, that's okay. That's Perfect. acceptable. Mm -hmm. All right. And, it, and every step of the way, you're acknowledging, and you have to acknowledge, the authority of your superiors. Okay? It's not a democracy. Okay? But on the other hand, the American military is capable of, it sounds like, learning, right? So that's good. But political, the type of political interaction that Aristotle envisions as good for a society is not that hierarchical. Okay? And it's not that hierarchical. It's not the you know the the uh, sergeant says this and go do it, okay. Um, and maybe you might be able to provide feedback. It's as we've said before, rule being ruled and ruling in turn, being able to deliberate and so forth. So in that case, the the, the type of skill involved in leadership in the military setting is not the same type of skill necessary for leadership in the civilian setting, okay? Where, you know, deliberation amongst equal citizens occurs, okay? Now, it sounds kind of ideal, right? Because what happens lots of times in your experience when committees or political groups get together to deliberate? Do they truly deliberate? Do they always all um, behave as equal citizens and listen to each other. And, you know, unfortunately, um, the, the dynamic of groups tends to be that, that some people lead and others follow still. Okay? So there's that. I mean, some people are more vocal and aggressive than others and so forth. Okay? So I don't know if, if Aristotle fully takes into account that aspect of human nature, but certainly what he wants and what he thinks politics should be about 
is a much more equal um, situation where the citizens are capable of deliberating and agreeing uh, together. Okay, so too much emphasis on on where war does not create uh, the mentality that works the best, he says, in peace. All right, so that's another problem with Sparta, I guess. Um, there's a lot of problems with Sparta, <laughs> according to Aristotle. He much prefers Athens, and he, in a way, he kind of idealizes Athens, I think, you know. And in his teaching, he is also trying to improve on Athens because Athens was probably a little bit more of a direct democracy than he would have preferred. So he goes into this issue of citizenship more and what makes a real citizen and what kind of citizens do we see. One thing that you may have noticed is that he goes back and forth really between actual practice in a variety of settings and then what he would prefer. So hopefully that won't confuse you, but he, you know, he goes back and forth quite a bit. And this is one area where he definitely does that. Um, he asks the question, who or what is the citizen? How do we define a citizen? And um, he says at the bottom of um, chapter 1 on 67, it's evident from this who the citizen is, for we can now say that someone who is eligible to participate in deliberative and judicial office is a citizen in this city-state, and that a city-state, simply speaking, is a multitude of such people adequate for life self-sufficiency. Well, that's his best situation, okay? Okay, when, he, when he's saying that, it's evident who the citizen is in the best situation, in the best type of city-state. It's somebody who is able to participate in deliberative and judicial office, okay? Who's eligible for those things. And, and uh, best is when every citizen, every citizen is eligible for those things, okay? But he also discusses who is the citizen in a variety of regimes, okay? So who is the citizen, for instance, in, a, in an absolute pure democracy? Who would count as a citizen? Pretty much every every male, every male um, in Athens, it was you know every male born of an Athenian woman, uh, so a native-born male. Okay? Um, and yes, they were they were encouraged to participate, but not all of them did. Okay, um, and so the pure democracy's view of the citizen is more what what Aristotle would call a multitude. You know. They're not really full citizens. They're only citizens to the extent that they actually participate. Okay? And some do, some don't, and so forth. So it depends upon the quality of the democracy um, how many people are citizens. Because Aristotle ties citizenship up with participation. Okay? So what would he say about people in our own uh, uh, country who don't vote, who don't pay attention, as we've talked about, who don't never do any sort of public service, etc. They're not actually citizens, <coughs> right? I mean, that's not what we would say. We would say, you know, <coughs> citizenship is a legal concept. You know, if you were born here or you applied for citizenship and received it, you're a citizen. Okay. You're a citizen, and so you have the right to vote. You have the right to do these things. Doesn't mean you have to, but we still recognize you as a citizen, right? So Aristotle is saying something different here. He's saying you're not really a citizen uh, if you don't uh, do these things. Um, who's a citizen in an oligarchy, from Aristotle's perspective? That's a, the rule by wealthy, the wealthy few. Yeah, just rich people, right? The people, the people who actually rule are the only citizens and everybody else is the multitude, the people, okay? And in a tyranny, who are the citizens? The top, except for the top? Yeah, actually, just, there's just one, 
right? So um, you can see that in a tyranny, you don't really have a political regime at all. It doesn't qualify. If there's only one citizen, there's really no um, political system. Okay. So in all of these cases, <coughs> pure democracy, oligarchy, tyranny, those are perverse, perverted regimes. They're, they're lesser regimes. Um, and in them, the citizen, the role of the citizen is very dubious and incomplete, okay? Even in a pure democracy, okay? And for those who do participate, there's self-interest rules. In a pure democracy, in his view, it's ruled by the poor because in you know, his experience, for the most part, the vast majority are poor, right? And the only reason they will participate is to try to, you know, sort of level things economically. So when they participate, they're representing themselves as an economic class, and they're going to try to um, take money and property away from the wealthy who have it. Okay? And so that's why their citizenship is only partial. It's not good enough because placed in that situation, they're not capable and they will not think about the, the good of all people but only their narrow <coughs> class interests. Same thing with the oligarchy. If only the rich are in charge, then every decision they make is going to be about their narrow economic self-interest, protecting their property, okay? keeping the poor majority at bay. Okay? But they're not going to be thinking about the common good. And of course, with a tyranny, typically they only think about themselves. All right? Everybody else is a slave, as Aristotle says. Okay? So Aristotle says none of these are good, and the best city is one where the good citizen and the good person are the same, okay? which is interesting. In other words, the best type of regime is the one in which you can be a fully good person. Okay? And that's why I put up some of these examples here so that you can get a feel for what he's talking about. In Nazi Germany, who would be considered the good citizen? Depends on who you ask. Now, if you were asking the government, okay? Aryan, who's racist towards Jews and Korean, supported the government, no matter what, like supported Hitler? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No matter what. The so person good. who's an Aryan, certain people are excluded simply because they're not identified with a certain race. They also have to adhere to this racist ideology. They have to be totally loyal to the state, right? But that's not at all a good person by any, any uh, reasonable measure. So, and of course, Aristotle, not by Aristotle's measure, because the good citizen is somebody who thinks beyond themselves and thinks about the common good, okay? So, you know, you know, the good citizen would be the totally opposite of a good human being in that type of regime. What about in a communist government like the Soviet Union? Who's the good citizen? There, I, I guess, really, from Aristotle's standards, there's no citizens really in, in a communist regime, right? But how would the regime define the good citizen? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If you're not a member of the Communist Party, not a loyal member, and not obedient to that regime, then you're not a good citizen. And again, you know, some of the best people, morally speaking, from the point of view of, you know, the, the, the concept of virtue that Aristotle uh, develops throughout his book, such a person would not be good. Some of the best people would be those who descended from that regime. And the same thing with dictatorship like North Korea. You'd have to be completely loyal or Dennis Rodman, right? right? What's wrong with him? He's always had a couple screws loose. He's got some screws loose. He's always been that way. Wow, that's really incredible. Maybe he should move there and be a citizen of North Korea. <laughs> Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> that just that even surprised me. You know, there's uh, there's very few things that surprise me. You know, in the political realm, but every once in a while something happens that you just like. I would have expected um, maybe some Hollywood sort to go over there and 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 you know befriend him. But this guy, I really, I mean, it was just sort of like, how did that happen? Anyway, so uh, obviously he's got a pretty high standard for citizenship, and if you uh, cannot be a good person in, and obey your regime at the same time, then the government is no good. That's, that's how he evaluates governments, you know. The best type of government is one that cultivates your, your citizens' character in the right direction, that makes them care about other people that makes them care about justice, okay? And justice as he defines it, not as a, you know, Kim Jong-un or, you know, uh, Adolf Hitler would define it. So, of course, that, that means that Aristotle uh, is one of those idealists who thinks that he can define justice and measure uh, regimes accordingly, right? So. So he uh, expresses his ideal of uh, the proper type of rule and citizenship on the bottom of page 72 when he says, but there is also a kind of rule exercised over those who are similar in birth and free. And we call this political rule. So these other forms of rule are not political. Remember that you know political means something uh, very unique to him. It's, or, uh, particular to him. It, it involves social, you know, the social interaction, right? So we call this political rule. A ruler must learn it by being ruled, okay? So that would preclude, you know, the <coughs> Korean system where the father dies, the son inherits the rule or anything like that because he has no experience with being ruled. Technically, he's being ruled by his father. I suppose, yeah, technically. technically. But not enough to get that experience of really being, you know, that had did he have to experience what the average North Korean yeah, citizen? You know, not at all. You know, he's probably. living at the palace and having the best of everything. Um, and but what Aristotle is talking about is how can you rule if you haven't been on the receiving end of rule? If you're really on the receiving end of rule, then you will know what is necessary you will have a much better idea of what is needful, not just for you, but for other people. So he says, just as one learns to be a cavalry commander by survey, serving under a cavalry commander, or to be a general by serving under a general, or under a major or a company commander, to learn to occupy office. Hence, this too is rightly said, that one cannot rule well without having been ruled. And whereas the virtues of these are different, a good citizen must have the knowledge and the ability both to be ruled and to rule, and this is the virtue of a citizen, to know the rule of free people from both sides. So most of us have the um, experience of being ruled, but a lot of us have not held any sort of office, okay? Um, does, is, do you consider that to be a, um, a defect, as Aristotle probably would, that we, most of us go through life and we, we do experience being ruled, but we don't ever get put in a position where we rule? I mean, politically, obviously, in the workplace we may more likely. But do you think there's something essential that we're missing by not maybe serving on a board or at some point running for county board or city commission or um, there's any number of opportunities we could put ourselves into where we get to be a part of the decision-making process? Would that help us? I don't know necessarily think it would. We have way more people than they did in that. Yeah, that's part of the problem. Arnhardt points that out in his book. This is partly what 
it makes it hard for us to imagine applying this concept. I mean, it makes sense because Athens is just like several thousand people, a couple thousand people maybe. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, maybe. I mean, in the outlying areas to do Athens. Yeah. But I mean, in any given like larger city, we have millions of people living in one city. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if it's kind of bad, but I think there are some people that have no business being in this. <laughs> yeah, well, there's that, right? There's that. I they think just the, have no business. I think the founders thought that, too. I mean, the lesson they learned from the ancient world was you probably shouldn't have everybody in positions to rule. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel like I think it's more important to learn how to probably be ruled than to like rule, I think. One, because of just the lack of opportunity, but like, I, I just feel the same way that I think, I think everyone should learn how to like, serve and follow in some footsteps. And I, I just don't think everyone necessarily needs to, for even their own sake, um, get into a position where they're ruling others. I just, yeah, I, I don't know why. I think it's just more important to serve, like learn how to serve early and like how to like um, submit in certain ways, just so you can carry that. So like, yeah. Yeah. Well, practically, I think, um, you know, it's a good point that practically speaking, it's difficult for everybody to do that. If you could do it, if at some point in your life you were able to serve in some capacity in, in the political world, would it make your perspective as a citizen different when you obeyed those laws, when you voted and, and did, you know, did the other things that a private citizen does? Would it make a difference if you had once held some sort of office? Maybe change your perspective? You'd have more sympathy for the person because they're in charge of a lot more things and you're not really thinking about that with criticizing. Uh-huh. There is that. Yeah. We're very good as <laughs> as private citizens at looking at our leaders and, and being very critical of them. Um, why can't they see it this way? Why can't they just do that? But it's true that once a person gets into a, an office, we see this with, you know, the most uh, the most prominent example being our presidents. Every single one of them learns, you know, when they get into that position that there are certain things they've talked about that are impractical, um, and now they know, you know. Um, and I'm sure the same thing would apply at every level of government. If you actually were on the city commission, you would then understand how difficult it is to to actually get some things done. Because mm -hmm. maybe another thing Aristotle was looking at, um, once you're actually in that position, you learn more about it. It's hard to change something that you don't understand. So, but mm -hmm. every, citizen, every citizen really understands what it to be ruled, or it feels like to be in a position of ruling, then they know the best way to change it if something's not working. Because a lot of people are really pessimistic about politics, but not a lot of people seem to be coming with any like, solutions to it. it was they like, otherwise don't like politics, but it's like, maybe if we understand more about like, how those positions work, we can say like, oh, this needs to be changed, or something like that. Yeah, you would have better judgment, because you have a, a better vantage point from which to make judgment. So, ideally, it would probably be a good thing. I think that, um, though, that it's an excellent point that in our country, because it's so huge, um, that not everybody can. Everybody can become interested if they really want to and, and, and make more informed decisions. But Aristotle's no doubt got something that if you've ever been in a political position of any kind at any level, you're much more likely to continue to be interested, whereas the typical <coughs> citizen of our country has to make a real effort uh, and, and probably does feel quite a bit of disconnect with what's going on, you know, because they have never been there. You know, and for them, it's you know why why aren't these people producing what I want? You know, so um, yeah, you know, but but uh, you made the same point Arnhardt made that uh, we just have a different type of regime, and it's got its own virtues. Its stability is is the great thing about it. You know, the way that it's set up um, le leads to a great deal of stability while giving people some opportunity to participate. All right, so I still think for you guys, for people in, uh, who are interested in politics, finding some way to do it 
at some point is a good thing, um, and you should. Um, and I think it does, it, it always changes. Even if you don't um, actually achieve political office yourself, but you get involved with helping uh, other people achieve that office, that does the same sort of thing. If you help somebody win office by helping with their campaign, and you deal with, you see them going through that process, and then holding office and understanding what they're dealing with, okay? It gives you that same perspective. All right, so we can already see that Aristotle does follow Plato on uh, making a distinction between those forms of government which are good, true forms, and those that are corrupted or perverted. Um, uh, you know, he would agree with Plato that uh, if, if you could find a wise man who also happened to be a monarch, you would have a good government, okay? But he's even more dubious, if anything, of, of the possibility of that, and what normally is the case is tyranny, okay? Because of the great power, the temptation of that power. Yes, we can have aristocracy, which for Plato is rule of the wise, and you know, and this would be nice, but uh, most oftentimes uh, when the few rule, in real life it's not the wise who rule, but the rich. And so you get again the corrupting influence and the, and the factionalization of the society. And then, you know, he also is critical, like Plato, <coughs> of pure democracy, okay? Because pure democracy is too much about the needs of the poor and creating class warfare and so forth. But here's where he differs from Plato, whereas Plato fixes on, you know, still saying the rule of the wise is best. Aristotle backs away from that and in a really interesting way, you know, he says that a democracy is best, actually, as long as it is mixed and constitutional, okay? As long as it has a, a constitution, and what I mean by mixed is that the constitution puts power in, some power in the hands of the many, and some power in the hands of the few. So as we go along in this book, you, you see him advocating for a type of balance, you know, in which uh, two institutions are created, the, maybe the Senate and the Assembly, a body that represents the few, who are the rich, and a body who rep that represents the many, and, and we've already seen he's hoping that that will include a lot of people that are not abjectly poor, because then they're still going to be focusing mainly on their own benefit, but who are from a middle class, okay? And Aristotle says that this is, this is the best practical regime, this is the best of all those that are likely to ever exist. Okay, he says on page 77, uh, since constitution and governing class signify the same thing, and the governing class is the authoritative element in any city state, and the author authoritative element must either be one person or few or many, then whenever the one few or many rule in the common benefit, these constitutions must be correct, but if they aim at the private benefit, which is what happens most of the time, whether of the one or the few or the multitude, they are deviations, okay? And that's why uh, the polity is a better solution, okay? Because it, in effect, puts these two different classes of people into a position where they have to compromise, all right? Now, do you think that Plato would have liked this idea of compromise. Compromises never are perfectly just and right, right? And many people are at least partly unhappy. So this is very different, you know, from Plato's point of view, the idea of compromise. And also the idea that given the right situation, Aristotle actually thinks that the people have a certain wisdom, okay? Sort of sounds like John Stuart Mill in this regard, interestingly, okay? 
if the people are put into this mixed regime where their, their needs and views have to be balanced against others, and where they have enough property to have a stake in the well-being of the society, then Aristotle says their decisions collectively are better than those of the few. Okay? He says that, yes, I mean, maybe if you ask each one individually what, you, what should you do, you would find that a lot of them would be incorrect, that they would not have good ideas. But if you put them into a collective body where they have to deliberate, their decisions will be superior to those that would become up, that would be brought up by the few. Okay? Why would that be? Mm -hmm. exactly what he thinks. You know, there's a lot of people involved. They have, they will come with a lot of different perspectives and information. These are the people out there living the lives of the citizens. They know what works and what doesn't work, okay, because of their experience. And when they come together to deliberate, if, if some of them come up with really crazy solutions or ideas, other people are going to knock those down. There's going to be enough people there um, with different points of view, okay, that the, the, the wild and crazy ideas will be put aside and they will arrive at solutions, laws that actually work best. And this is without them being particularly wise. So there's no requirement that these people be philosophers or somehow have a, a wonderful, perfect understanding of justice. All they have to do is be rational and understand that their interests are tied up with the good of the country as a whole. And yes, some of them will have various different points of view, but in the process of being forced to compromise, the wingnut ideas will be you know, put aside and they will arrive at you know, <coughs> the compromise, which actually will represent the interests of most people most of the time, okay? So, very, very different point of view on this, on the promise of the average person being able to take part in deciding and do so in a way that will actually end up being good for people. Um, now again, you know, with the, with the caveat that obviously, um, it's a smaller community, as you've pointed out, and where people can actually all go and deliberate as citizens, okay? which can't really happen here. Okay? Um, so unlike Plato, who, who continues to prefer rule by the wise and who would see any sort of democratic governance as a real step down, I mean, he did acknowledge it's not the worst Okay, tyranny is the worst, but it's not good and it's not capable in his view of making good decisions. Um, Aristotle, by modifying and by proposing polity, thinks that he's created a, syst a situation, a constitution, that can produce good outcomes. And this is the beginning of this idea of the mixed regime, which goes all the way up to, you know, the development of republican government in uh, Europe and then um, our own constitution. Okay. So he was on to something. He was, you know, on to something very practical here. You know, let's create a, a, a framework in which people's natural tendencies that they that they have will work to their advantage, rather than trying to change them all into the very best 
you know, the philosopher or the truly, absolutely virtuous person. Okay, you don't need to do that. But notice that in this type of government, he's also thinking that the experience of having to compromise, of having to deliberate compromise, will make people better. Okay? They may not be morally perfect, but they will be made better by the process of having to do that, because they're going to be forced to consider other people's point of view. They're going to be forced to think outside of their own class interests and so forth. And that will make them better people. And so in that kind of regime, you're most likely to get <laughs> good people. So his ideal of, you know, the best government is where the good man and the good citizen are the same, that is best fulfilled in the polity. 